it's really the beginning of autumn now and the leaves on the trees are starting to turn and mornings are characteristically cool and dewy and acorns everywhere from our big oak tree and one of the things that starts to happen here in autumn obviously is the leaves fall and so as we look around we're going to find dead leaves from the trees on the ground and maybe stuck to things and hung up in spider webs and so on and I just wanted to show you this because this at first glance looks like a dead leaf that's been blown in the wind and stuck to the frame of the door here but in fact it's a little moth and look how closely that's mimicking the appearance of a dead leaf now I'm sure we can identify this moth so you'll be seeing its name on the screen right now now I happen to like moths I think more than butterflies I think um, I don't know whether it's a loving the underdog thing but uh, I just happen to think moths are more interesting and I don't know hard working I guess is the term they're trying a little bit harder than butterflies butterflies have got so have got all the color and the excitement but moths actually are there in the background hiding away so this one's pretending to be a dead leaf there we go have a look at that so it's towards the end of the growing season so we've got a few things left to harvest in the garden here we've got some rainbow chard there a few potatoes left and then We've got some weeds, but these weeds here, or at least some of them, are edible. So let's get in close and have a look at what we've actually got growing here. So down here, most of what you can see growing here is chickweed. Now, it is mixed in with something which we definitely don't want to eat, which is sun spurge. So I'll show you the difference between those two things. So let's get a bit of chickweed. This is chickweed here, and it's a sprawling plant with soft sappy sort of stems very sprawling bushy sort of nature and it has these tiny little starry white flowers here let's just see if we can get a focus on those tiny little flowers there and we'll see if we look at the stems can't really tell here at the moment because they're wet but in dry weather you'll see there's a little line of hairs that runs up one side of the stems just a little sort of fringe of tiny little bristle hairs so that's chickweed now the plant that's growing in amongst it which if you if I just pulled handfuls of this up we would no doubt pick some by accident but the plant that's growing up in between in in amongst it is this it's sun spurge now superficially quite similar but actually quite easy to tell the difference it's a slightly darker green and this one when we cut it in half we get this milky latex which is actually I don't want to get that on my skin because it's an irritant so judicious picking is necessary because we've got the two things growing together but it's not difficult to tell the difference the other thing about sun spurge we'll see if we look at the end of one of the stems it's got this kind of weird symmetry to it which is different to the symmetry of chickweed so not difficult to tell the difference just need to have our eyes open so I think what we might do is pick some of this chickweed because it's it's quite good in salads. You can also mix it up in batter and make fritters and that's very tasty and nutritious. So I think we'll pick some of this and have it for our dinner. Okay, we've got a couple of small international mini food halls. Let's, so let's have a look. So I went to Thai Spice in Fairham and I've got... <laughs> Green IU Jelly, that's going to be featured on Weird Stuff in a Can very soon. Green Curry Fried Mackerel. Uh, minced Crab in Spices. Interesting. Some Curry Noodles, Curry Me Noodles. These are from... Malaysia and 
some purple fleshed sweet potatoes. These were quite expensive because they've been flown in from Thailand. So I didn't get an awful lot. I got just four potatoes. Four, and that cost me about five pounds. So we'll make the most of those sometime. So that's my mini Asian food haul. And there's also going to be a mini Polish food haul. So let's have a look at what we got at the Polish shop. Also in Fairham. So we got some sliced gherkins. Really good. We got some nice rye bread with multi seeds. We got favourite we've had before some blueberry Jaffa cakes and also some hedgehog biscuits. Beer mustard. Now I've had this before and it's really, really good. It's a very mild sweet mustard that you can just spread or dip sausages in all sorts of things and of course it comes in a nice little jar that is a free drinking glass we've got some sausage some kielbasa goralska we'll have a taste of that in a minute and finally some sprats sprats in tomato sauce now sprats used to be really popular in this country and they've fallen out of favor and people tend to eat sardines or pilchards or mackerel now but uh, sprats used to be very very popular fish so i've never tried them so we'll try those sometime that might be weird weird stuff in a can only because it's it's kind of un unusual to find sprats in this country now so so that's the mini polish food hall so let's just try a little bit of this kielbasa. In my previous Polish food haul video, lots of people said, why are you cutting the skin off this sausage? And I didn't know any better. So I've since bought some of this and, and eaten it and obviously eaten the skin. Yes, hello Eva. Hello little nose. Um, I've since realized obviously that you can eat the skin on this. That's where all the flavor is on a sausage like this as well. Mm. Wow, that is really tasty. Really lovely, smoky, garlicky, firm, cooked pork sausage. Mm. That is so good. Mm. Yeah, I bet you would love it, Eva, wouldn't you? <laughs> Just down here off camera, there's a little dog hoping for a piece of sausage. It's got garlic in it, Eva. I don't think you better. Uh, the other thing people picked me up in my previous Polish food video was the way I sliced the sausage. I cut a piece and then I sliced it into weird long slices. Um, that was really only just because that's how I tend to make sandwiches. I, if I'm making a sandwich, I tend to cut long pieces of something so that it doesn't fall out when I pick it up. But uh, a lot of people commented on that and that was just me being weird. So we're down here at Leon Solon, the tide's all the way out and actually it's a good place to do, well not exactly rock pooling, but there's exploration of the uh, tidal shore to be done in those pools behind the spits that are exposed and the banks that are exposed at low tide. We're taking advantage of a bit of sunshine really and look at that sky up there, it's threatening all kinds of weather for us, in fact I can see rain falling over by Forley Power Station over there. So uh, it might be a bit of a short, might be a bit of a short visit today. Now from my Isle of Wight video, you might remember I said this is not, that was not my normal view of the Solent. This is my normal view of the Solent. This is a, uh, that's the Isle of Wight across there in the distance. So uh, lots of people out sailing, although there's not very much of a breeze. I think the dog wants me, so, um, Right, off we go. Eva's wondering why I'm not catching up. Okay, I'm coming, Eva. All of where we're standing at the moment is underwater at high tide. And uh, this is typical of the seashore along the Solent near where I live. It's all flint, pebbles. What's the matter, Eva? What? You don't like the sea. Yeah, well, don't... No, go, just go and enjoy yourself. Just go and play. Just go and play. 
So we'll just have a look at a little bit of the wildlife here. We have got barnacles and winkles on the rocks here. And also there are mussels here. So there are blue mussels. They tend to be buried in the sand and shingle here. And underneath, under the sand and shingle there will be other mollusks. So there are um, cockles here and various other clams. I wouldn't eat any shellfish from here because it's probably a, a little bit industrially polluted. So uh, really just enjoying the walk today. I think it's sometimes interesting going across the sand like this and you get to see little areas like this where we can see the tracks of various little worms and mollusks and bits of sea life have left their trails in the, in the soft wet sand. In fact, if we look over here, there's all sorts of things. So those will be tiny little shells, little mollusks, uh, sea snails, all sorts of tiny marine life. Maybe little shrimps and things like that as well. Oh, well that's interesting. Over there, I don't know if you can see that, there is a hovercraft going out across from Leon Solent. Now, there is a hovercraft museum up there where the, the very large cross-channel hovercrafts reside. I don't think that's one of the very, very big ones. Not something you so often see. So we're just walking out on the spit. We will have to keep an eye on the tide because it is coming in now. We'll have a look at that in a minute. But I just wanted to show you this. This is These are slipper limpets down here. And they're very commonly found in little chains and clusters like this. And there's three mollusks, one on top of the other there, and they're a type of limpet, and they stick together like that. Now, they're stuck to a stone at the moment, but very often you'll find the bottom one has died, and the rest are just stuck to a dead shell in a chain. Curious thing about slipper limpets is that the bottom one in this chain, the one that's stuck to the rock, is female. And the bottom one in the chain is always female. What happens is, eventually this one will die and fall off, or it will die and it will let go of the rock and then there will be an empty shell there and that triggers the next one in the chain to change from male to female and then the males above it in the chain will mate with it and it will lay eggs and so on and then it will die and the bottom empty shell will drop off and so on and the cycle will repeat and so the bottom one in the chain is always female and it's triggered to turn female by the death of the one below it it's quite weird isn't it so we can see if we stand here for too long we're going to get wet feet because the tide is just gradually coming in now. Each successive wave is breaking a little bit further over the gravel and the sea is returning to inundate this gravel spit and it will cover it up completely. I just saw lightning strike over there off of what must be, I think, Leap Beach. Interesting, you didn't hear any thunder. There it is. It's going to strike again the moment I turn the camera off, isn't it? Quite a dramatic sky over there, really. No, nope, I don't think we're going to get any more. That's a shame. Right, I'm, I'm going to get moving before that rain comes and gets us.
It's good that she's digging though, because she's had a manicure today, so I'll round off the ends of her claws. Yeah, you made a right mess there, didn't you? What are you digging for? What is it? It's been a fantastic year for mushrooms already and autumn's really only just got going but I'm just returning here to the spot where we picked horse mushrooms before because the rain has brought up another lovely little crop of mushrooms. I'm going to harvest these while they're nice and small and young. Sorry about the traffic noise in the background. We are in between a couple of roads. We're far enough away from the road that I don't have to worry about soil splash from the actual vehicles. So here we are, lovely little uh, basket full of mushrooms there. That's gonna be my lunch today. Okay, so we've picked some fantastic little horse mushrooms here. Now horse mushrooms will grow to quite a lot larger size than this. So I did feel a little bit bad about picking them at this size. However, at this time of year, we could get a frost at any moment and that would ruin them. So I'm going to live with myself, I think. So let's get these cleaned up. We're just going to brush the dust off them. There's a few little bits of dirt and sand. There are a few bits I might want to cut out where I'm just going to examine this one a little bit carefully because it looks like something might have eaten its way into the middle there. So I'm going to make sure I haven't got a wood louse in there or something like that. So let's get these, I'll get these cleaned up. You've seen me do that before, so I won't bother covering it again. But it's just going to be a little paintbrush, stiff paintbrush. We'll just brush the sand off the stalks, cut away any bad bits. And then we'll cook something up with these. Okay, just wanted to look at something that's a common feature of these horse mushrooms. But it was a little bit alarming the first time I ever saw it. There is a mushroom that's quite similar in appearance to the horse mushroom called the yellow stainer, which is poisonous. It'll give you gastric upsets if you eat it. And all parts of that mushroom stain quite bright yellow when cut. Now, it is not uncommon to see a little bit of yellow staining on horse mushrooms and other agaricus species. So there's sometimes a bit of yellowing on the cap here as well. And sometimes after they've been cut for an hour or more, you'll find a little bit of yellowing, tiny little bit there, you see, on the stalks and other parts of horse mushrooms and other agaricus. First time I saw that, it frightened me and I threw the lot away and I wasted a basket full of field mushrooms. But the point is, the yellow stainer is different from this. All parts of the mushroom will stain very conspicuously yellow when bruised or cut. And so we'd find, if this was the yellow stainer, just scraping it like that, it would stain bright yellow almost immediately which it's not doing here so we'll cut that in half just so we can see yeah if that was the yellow stainer we'd already be seeing conspicuous yellow staining right the way around the cap and the stalk and all the other damaged parts there and we're not getting any of that there this is definitely not the yellow stainer, this is the horse mushroom. I know that for a fact anyway because I picked from this spot before and in fact this is a second flush on the same ring of horse mushrooms that I picked earlier in the year. Right, so we're going to make a mushroom omelette. Uh, I'm just going to put some finely chopped shallots there in the pan and we'll just soften those before we put the mushrooms in. Okay, now those onions are just starting to take a tiny bit of colour there. So now we'll just get those mushrooms in. One I didn't chop up there. We'll be back in a moment to chop up the couple that I missed. Now 
Now I've noticed on the camera, <laughs> it looks like these mushrooms are a lot more yellow than they actually are. You mustn't worry about that, that's an artifact of the lighting. They are quite definitely horse mushrooms. And that yellow is just the way the lights in here work. I'll give them a bit of help with a chunk of butter there. Now we've got a lot of juices and liquid has come out of those mushrooms. So I'm going to simmer it until that's all reduced away before we add the eggs. Otherwise we'll just end up with watery scrambled egg. We'll just have a little twist of black pepper in there. Tiny bit of salt. I'll put that in now because the pepper will infuse into the liquid and then it will absorb back into the mushrooms. We're going to get the eggs in there. So we'll beat those now. And it is the sound actually that's tipped me off that this is almost ready to start. It's the sound has gone from a, just a bubbling sound to a proper sizzling frying sound. So we'll just make sure that all of the larger pieces are completely finished shedding their liquid. And we can see that the fat is bubbling around the mushrooms now. The fat from the butter is there. And there's just a ever so slight browning starting to happen on some of those mushroom pieces. So let's get the eggs in there. Just turn that down a tiny bit because I don't want it to burn on the bottom. Just for a bit of extra flavour, I've got some little cubes of mature cheddar cheese that I'm just going to scatter across the top here and put them in now and that will allow them to melt into the omelette. And then when we're nearly done, we're going to toast the top. Okay, now I'm pretty sure the omelette's cooked quite well underneath. I'm not going to try and fold it because it will just break apart with all those mushrooms in there. So we're going to toast the top of it using a blowtorch. Now this is not a chef's blowtorch, this is just a plumbing blowtorch, just a regular plumber's blowtorch. I'm nearly out of gas, so... And I'm just going to gently toast okay that's probably enough i reckon let's turn off the heat and just let that rest for a moment i'm not going to make you sit and watch me eat the whole of this omelette so i'm just going to serve up a little wedge of it just so you can see what it looks like inside so that's that's lovely so down at the bottom there it's just crisped up nicely but inside it's still gooey the cheese and the egg is just just set let's have a little taste it's going to be scalding hot so i need to be a bit careful Oh wow, that's really good. There is just something about wild mushrooms. So, you know, I just encourage people to find someone who knows about mushrooms and get out there, start enjoying them. Mm. So thanks for watching and I hope to see you again soon.